And I want to stand in the protocol that was already established since yesterday, and I want to go straight into um, the discussion. I want to take a slightly different approach uh, to the question of legal and constitutional uh, implications, particularly uh, regarding the proposals that have been made for the regions. Comrade President and, and dear delegates, I, you know, when you look at law reform, which is the mandate of the Law Reform Development Commission, but also the mandate of many of our authorized ministries in the country, there is a difference in the manner in which you look at law, when you are interpreting law, when you are reviewing law, um, and when you are looking at the fundamental law of the country. I think which point I agree with, uh, with Susan Amanji on, you cannot look at the interpretation of the law um, in general and the interpretation of a constitution in the same manner. I say this because when you talk about interpreting a constitution anywhere in the world, including Namibia, and there is sufficient case law since 1991 that tells us that constitutional interpretation has to do with two key things. One is that we must have a purposive approach to interpreting the constitution. And secondly, you need to consider the values and the aspirations of the people of that particular country. And the values and the aspirations of the Namibian people is captured in our preamble provisions of the constitution. The second aspect when you talk about constitutional interpretation is the question about what is it that the Namibian people would want to see. And that question is very relevant for our purposes here today. I think when we interpret legal text, there is always going to be a difference of opinion. Uh, two lawyers, as you know, will interpret the exact same provision uh, very differently. Yeah. But I think yeah, in this hall, the lawyers around the table do agree that the Constitution is supreme. The lawyers around the table um, agree that the provisions in Chapter 3 are entrenched, and I'm happy that as of yesterday, we were basically saying it's not that you cannot amend chapter 3, but you can only amend it in a manner that it makes the rights better. So to, to add more, to increase and, 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 and give us more rights, rather than taking away from our rights. And I think we agree on, on that score. But the intention for us as the Law Reform and Development Commission is to allow what the president called a dialogue. This, for us, is an opportunity that people are allowed the, to, to have the space to speak openly. Because at the end of the day, we will come back to the lawyers to craft the law. But for now, what we want to hear are the voices of the people inspired by what are the common values and aspirations for them. That's, that's, that's the one point. And the second point, when you hear the lamentations from the regions, is that we have a land conference today because there is a problem. And when you are seeking justice, which is what we are all seeking, because our Namibian constitution talks about not only the rule of law, not only the sovereignty and unity of the state, but it also talks about a principle of justice for all. And if people are asking, and when people are asking for, for example, ancestral claims, they're basically saying, we are feeling treated unjustly. So let's, let us do something about that situation. So justice. I want us to think about justice and the land reform question within the conception of justice. Let's think about our Namibian constitution 
our review of the law in an African context. Because the Western conception of what the rule of law is and the African conception of what the rule of law are two different things. In South Africa, for example, they developed a conception of Ubuntu. And if you're talking about the conception of Ubuntu, there is a different way that you will look at the legal text that you are confronted with. So it's important that we locate our debate about land reform within the conception of African justice. The third aspect, the third aspect and, and, and Cesar referred to it as, and I think quite poignantly, about checks and balances. We have organs of state, which consist of your executive, your legislature, and your judiciary. Something that does not come out quite clearly up to this point is the role of the judiciary, the role of our courts. If there is legal uncertainty, like it seems to be the case when we're debating questions around ancestral land, around expropriation and so forth, the courts have a role to play. And as the Law Reform and Development Commission, one of the things that we will call upon as part of these conversations here at this conference uh, would be the Attorney General as the principal legis legal advisor of the country and of the government would be able to approach the courts and say there is uncertainty, for ex example, about Article 131 right. and what it means, or Article 132 sub 5, or what it means, and how the, what the relationship is between the various provisions of the Namibian Constitution. And if we have that uncertainty, I think we have a court system where the independent judiciary that's impartial and competent that can provide us with some clarity so that we have certainty about what those particular provisions mean. So, when we interpret the Constitution, in 1991, in the corporal punishment case, in Kultura 2000, and even in 1995 with the Kaweza decision, the courts were very clear about a manner in which we interpret the Constitution so that we can avoid an overly technical and legalistic approach to interpreting the Constitution. So as we have this conversation, particularly um, this afternoon and tomorrow and, and the rest of the week, I really want us to listen to questions around ancestral uh, claims, questions around expropriation uh, in a manner that will enhance uh, the transformative nature of our constitution. When the president, your excellency, when you often say people don't need constitutions, this is the opportunity that we see the, uh, the, the constitution as a tool to transform our societies, as a tool that will enhance social justice. So just in terms of the specific areas, I think the, the calls for amendment should be considered in the context of what is possible within the uh, uh, framework of our constitution, <laughs> but specifically on aspects of ancestral land. Um, we, want, we thought it may be useful because I think a lot of the acceptance or rejection of that claim has to do with misunderstanding. Yeah. There seems to be some misunderstanding about what is required. Yeah. Now, when you talk about a claim, it is correct that you must firstly establish, am I entitled to that claim in law? Is there something in the Namibian constitution that does not make provision for ancestral claims? Once you've established that there is an entitlement, there is a right protected in the constitution, you must then say, and this is the point Caesar was making as well yesterday, you cannot just stop with the claim. You must then say what you want so that we can articulate as, as lawyers, we can articulate the remedy that you are entitled for what you are asking for. And it is for that reason that we think there needs to be some space created, and I know it's on the program, that we have um, that we discussed the, the kind of, of relief uh, you are seeking, 
and whether it is even possible within the context in which we find ourselves. But also, what is it in relation to land specifically that ancestral claim rights would want to see? It is therefore important that I think in, within the context of our constitution, we understand um, what we want to, to get. In the South African context, I think as lawyers of the lands, we do comparative studies. And we all know now that Section 25 of the South African Constitution, which was subsequent to, adopted subsequently to the Namibian one, I think there's some things that they've borrowed from us. But what they've done beautifully, which we didn't do too well, is they have provided a comprehensive protection provision under their property rights in the South African Constitution. There is nothing wrong with Namibians if we are satisfied yeah. after today's discussion or tomorrow's discussion that we think it may be useful for us to borrow uh, with adjustments, of course, that responds to our context on what, what the South Africans have done on our property rights in general. Um, so we can borrow if we think uh, there is a useful uh, lesson that we can learn from the South Africans. Then, of course, what the South Africans will have also done well, and I think this is something that is instructive for us as Namibians, is they have based their questions around property around three pillars. The first one being restitution. This is the block within or the bracket within which your ancestral claim rights would fall. And then there's the question of redistribution, which is something that we have done. Um, and then the third one, of course, is land tenure. I think all of us want some uh, security of tenure uh, as human beings. It's part of our right to life. The Indians, many years ago, in 1985, uh, through a, there was a problem around slum dwellers that were living on a pavement, actually interpreted the right to life to include livelihood. Livelihood meaning your basic amenities of life. What that tells me is that we can use other rights in the Namibian constitution. You don't have to have every right spelled out in the constitution. But for example, you cannot have an adequate right to life, for example, if you don't have shelter, if you do not have access to health, if you do not have access to sanitation and water. So we can be creative as lawyers, for instance, or as those that interpret the constitution to have an expansive approach or interpretation to our Bill of Rights, particularly our civil and, and political rights. So the right to life can be interpreted in such a manner that it includes life language. There, is, there are many examples of that kind of interpretation. So I think let's agree in, in principle, and this is my proposition to you, that we allow the conversation, because this is a space this is actually constitutional. What the government has done is part of what is required under Article 1, Sub 2 of the Namibian Constitution. Because in the, that constitution provision, it actually says the power, the power vests in the people. And because of our representative as government, what we do is we use our democratic institutions such as this land conference, to seek advice and policy guidance from our people. This is our opportunity to do so. And so we don't want, this is our proposal to vote for, we should not create, do not think that everything that has been said so far is not providing you with the flexibility to make the proposals that you think will enhance law reform in the country. Just lastly, if I may, uh, Your Excellency, uh, as the moderator, is that on expropriation, I think we all know now that expropriation is constitutionally sanctioned. And all we need to do is to, if the problems arise from the, of, from the legislative framework that we have at the moment, then what we need to do is to go back to it and enhance it, review it in a manner that it achieves the purpose for which we want each to achieve. So we can always go back to our resettlement policy, we can go back to our land policy, we can go back to our pieces of legislation that addresses issues or has created limitations around the issues 
it's called expropriation. Make it better in a way that it works for us. It works for us and it enhances the social justice we want to see. So South Africa is again very instructive on expropriation, I think, is that they have provided some guidelines in the constitution which we can use in another piece of legislation. Uh, some aspects of it has been dealt with by CESA yesterday, but I want to, uh, for emphasis, repeat the question around um, the current use of land, purpose of expropriation, market value, and so forth. We must not pass laws, and if we have, we have the prerogative to change it. That will, you know, sh sort of shoot ourselves in the foot. I think the Constitution is left under Article 16. It is left it sufficiently open, I think, for us to be flexible around what kind of policy framework we want to do. So let's not go back to a situation where uh, we shoot ourselves in, in the foot. On absentee land laws, um, I think there are regulations around how that can be dealt with. If it's not working for us right now, let's change it um, so that it, it works for what we want to achieve. Um, so in conclusion, if I may, Mr. President, I don't know how many times I've said that, um, is the question of uh, Article 144 of the Namibian Constitution. Article 144 of the Namibian Constitution says, if Namibia ratifies any international instrument, and we have ratified many of them, um, we have an obligation, both domestically and at the international level, we have an obligation to make sure that those instruments are part of our domestic legal setup. What that tells me is that if there are not sufficient safeguards in our constitution or in our domestic legislative framework, we should be able to import international instruments to enhance the case that we want to. I know there's a lot of um, international instruments, I mean, in, you know, that deals with issues around ancestral land, uh, dispossession of land, and so forth. If our domestic setup does not provide enough scope for us, we should use Article 144 of the Namibian Constitution to, to achieve that particular uh, purpose. Let me stop here and just say that we want to see a situation where this conference provides us with sufficient certainty and policy clarity on what we want to achieve in respect of land reform, particularly in a manner that it enhances the pace of um, access to land in its various formations. And we will be sitting there, the back that we've been doing, and taking notes of what kind of policy guidance uh, come from this platform. I want to stop there and, and just say thank you very much for, for your attention.